250th anniversary of the repulse of the Turks from Vienna is made the occasion of a big demonstration by the fascist government of Austria at the castle of Schronbrunn, the summer residence of the late emperor. Dr. Dolphus, the chancellor, dressed in his wartime uniform as a lieutenant, is the chief speaker, and his words are applauded by the great host of government supporters whose policy is to preserve the independence of Austria. Meanwhile, in Vienna, a hostile crowd of Austrian Nazis have gathered. The young bystanders jeer at the procession of fascists through the city as they march from Schonbrunn, headed by Prince von Stahrenberg leader of the Austrian fascist movement and descendant of the deliverer of Vienna from the Turks. Six hundred arrests were made by the police, mainly of young Nazis, who desire union of Austria with Germany. The Austrian Chancellor, from his sick room, thanks well-wishers for their messages of congratulation on his escape from death at the hands of an assassin, Rudolf Dertil. Whatever view be held of the politics of Dr. Dolphus, there can be but one opinion of the dastardly attempt on his life, and the whole world congratulates him. Civil war flares up suddenly in Austria. The government, deciding to suppress the socialists, countered a general strike by martial law. These pictures, rushed to Britain from Vienna, show vividly the state of desperate crisis through which Austria has been passing. The strongholds in which the Schutzbund, or Socialist Defence League, hold out are huge blocks of flats built for the Viennese workers by the Socialist Council of the city. Here, the socialists and communists, suspicious of the dictatorship of Dr. Dolphus, have secreted guns and ammunition for the coup d'etat which they feared. The strength of the buildings enables them to prolong resistance for several days, and artillery has to be brought into action against them. Dr. Dolphus, the diminutive Chancellor of Austria, who as dictator has decreed the suppression of the socialists, visits the scene of hostilities at Floridsdorf. Undoubtedly, large numbers have perished in the fighting. Various estimates are given. The socialist casualties on the first day are known to have included 1,500 dead. The government also claims thousands of prisoners, some of whom have been captured by the troops and Heimwehr, while others have chosen to give themselves up under the promised government amnesty. The spectacle of civil war in a European country can only confirm the determination in Britain to settle differences in peace and goodwill without recourse to the methods of bloodshed. A state of tension exists on the Austrian frontier in the Tyrol, where there are constant rumours of invasion by Austrian Nazis who have fled from their country into Bavaria. The truce which was called by the Nazis after the recent civil war is due to expire, and there is considerable misgiving as to what this third party, which was not concerned in the hostilities, proposes to do. Heimwehr men who are supporting the Dolphus government in power form a voluntary militia to guard the border. A bugle call summons them to immediate duty in their military formations. The roads are carefully watched, and it is necessary to present very satisfactory assurances before an unknown car is allowed to proceed. The signing of pacts has become of recent years a common occurrence, but here is an occasion which implies something big in European politics. Dr. Dolphus sets his hand to the instruments which align Austria and Hungary 
alongside Italy in the political Sherry Valley of the world. Now comes the Prime Minister of Hungary, General Gombers, to write his country's adhesion to the protocols. And finally, Signor Mussolini himself, resplendent in the uniform of the Knights of Malta, of which he is Grand Bailey, puts the finishing touch to an entente which provides that Italy, Austria and Hungary will speak with one voice in the councils of Europe. The stormy career of the courageous little Chancellor of Austria is terminated. Dr. Dolphus, who has already once been the object of an assassin's bullet, falls a victim to Nazi revolt in Vienna. The unhappy city, which has seen so much strife and so many barricades, became the scene of insurrection again when National Socialists, opposed to Dr. Dolphus's regime, rose and assailed the government. Dr. Dolphus was captured and suffered the fate of a hostage. The diminutive Chancellor, who has been such a notable figure on the European stage, had himself last February waged war on his other enemies, the Austrian Socialists. After the successful reduction of the Socialist strongholds, he announced the restoration of order in Austria and invited foreigners to visit his country with the assurance of absolute security. For this interview, he learnt the English phrase, goodbye. Good goodbye. Distracted Vienna draws breath after its day of hysteria. The flag of mourning hangs outside the chancellery where Nazi rebels seized and murdered Dr. Dolphus. Above the doorway is the balcony where Major Fye, covered from behind by armed Nazis, parleyed with the rescuing troops. The city is now full of soldiers and Heimwehr, who are kept busy moving on the crowds gathered to survey with morbid interest the scenes of the Nazi putsch. This is the broadcasting house, occupied by raiders who announced over the air that Dr. Dolphus had resigned and that Dr. Rintelen had become Chancellor. Dr. Rintelen, who was Austrian minister in Rome, was placed under arrest after the failure of the coup and in desperation shot himself. Now the coffin containing the body of the murdered Chancellor is removed from the Chancellery on the Ballhaus Platz. Full state ceremonial attends the transfer. President Miklas is chief mourner. Major Fye in uniform is here the nearest figure to the camera. The tall man walking alone is Prince Staremberg, head of the Heimwehr and now acting Chancellor. The procession winds its way to the city hall where the body is to lie in state. Meanwhile, Italian troops are moved by Mussolini to the Austrian border. The political implications of the murder of the little Chancellor assume big proportions. Europe awaits the outcome, with Hitler and Mussolini as the principals in a pregnant situation. <laughs> President Miklas makes his oration over the coffin of Dr. Dolphus. The patriot is dead at the hands of a murderer. Stricken mourners, the widow, Frau Dolphus, and Prince Staremberg on her left, in seltener Einmütigkeit, hat Europa, hat die Welt ihrem Mitgefühl bekundet. The bereaved mother and stepfather, both peasants, Major Fai, in the center of the group, hear the president proclaim his devotion to the ideals of the dead chancellor and thank the world for its expressions of solidarity. There is no peace in the Chancellor's passing. The route of the funeral procession is heavily lined with troops and Heimwehr, another outrage being thought possible. Windows are ordered to be kept closed and spectators are forbidden on balconies and roofs.
An exception is made in movie turns favor, as will be seen from these elevated views. A great man's funeral is usually impressive as setting the seal on a life's work, but in Vienna today, the stirring of popular sentiment is prompted by the recognition that the life work of Dr. Dolphus is uncompleted. Uncompleted not through time, but through the bullets of his enemies. Two wreaths only relieve the austerity of the red and white flag of Austria, which drapes the coffin. They are from the widow and bereaved children. The rivals of Dolphus always claimed that he had no backing in the country, and yet half a million people are gathered to see the cortege pass, and so at St. Stephen's Cathedral, the last rites are performed, and the church pronounces its benediction on a faithful Catholic. The first of Garden surveys his native Austria and precipitates upheaval in that unlucky country. Schusnig, who had presented a bold face to Nazi aspirations, bows before the storm and resigns. Seisinkart, Austrian Nazi in the government, carries on and carries out the German plan. Events move so swiftly that the story told today will be history tomorrow. One wonders where stands Mussolini in all this. In France, the divisions of political groups begin to mend, and Monsieur Blum gets busy forming a new government with a new solidarity. That map, or it will not be wanted again. A centuries-old boundary has been obliterated, and anxiety shifts to a new region. Germany moves into Austria. And these pictures will perhaps stir emotions in some of you which you may find it hard to repress. But sit through them calmly. They will teach us something, they will illustrate the seriousness of the times in which we live, and they will reinforce our determination to meet the difficulties of our world with courage. Whether German troops crossed into Austria before they were invited or not is now only an academic and unimportant point. They crossed and met with no opposition. Instead, they found welcome and rejoicing among sympathizers and those who dissented either stayed away or feigned enthusiasm. Removing the frontier barrier at Kufstein becomes almost a ritual. It goes to the museum or perhaps to the bonfire. Epitome of the great bloodless revolution which has agitated the world, German troops cross the Danube at Passau. Even small children have learnt the Nazi salute. Well, when